October 26th meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk. Get, get call Commissioner Dodge. Here. Commissioner Rice. Here. Commissioner Lieberman. Here. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we've got some exciting um, work to talk about. Um, we're going to hear about the recommendations from our Behavioral Health Task Force. So who's going to start? Haley? Okay, come on up. And then Sarah. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, I don't get up here too often. So I am very, very happy to be here today. As you might remember, in January, with your support, we launched the Montgomery County Behavioral Health Task Force. This was in collaboration with the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association. The task force is compromised of, comprised of healthcare providers, leaders, and community partners, and was established with the goal of developing solutions across our behavioral health system. I'm excited to be here today to introduce the Behavioral Health Task Force final recommendations. Over the past eight months, we've been meeting monthly and we've been really looking at how we can have a better understanding of the issues each sector faces when it comes to the behavioral health continuum. <clears throat> we looked at input from frontline staff and studied data to develop a more holistic approach when it comes to our behavioral health landscape and our community needs. The recommendations shared with you today highlight the collaboration and investment across our behavioral health system leaders. However, sharing the recommendations will not be the final step. We'll still have a lot of work to do to ensure that our behavioral health system is supported, whether that be our healthcare providers, judicial system, social services, or treatment centers. So now, I'd like to introduce Sarah Hockenbrot, President and CEO of the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association, who will provide an overview of the Montgomery County Behavioral Health Task Force recommendations and next steps. <coughs> Thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Haley. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you and joining you today to present our priority recommendations from the Behavioral Health Task Force. The recommendations fall into five categories that are shared to better serve the needs of our Montgomery <coughs> County residents. In total, we developed 28 recommendations spanning five categories, including oversight and leadership, access and the care continuum, data and technology, workforce, and advocacy and public awareness. Today we are going to highlight the priority recommendations as identified by the task force members. The first recommendation in oversight and leadership encourages the formalization of the behavioral health task force approach and operations. Ensuring that there is collaboration between leadership driven by looking at the same aggregate county level data is essential to driving change and improving the quality of care and interactions for individuals as well as those who serve their needs. Currently, we do not have a full and complete picture of how our Montgomery County is serving these individuals because none of the data sets tie together to give us a 360 degree view of every interaction that an individual might encounter. We believe that there is significant and positive progress available to us as a community by developing that shared vision and viewpoint from a data perspective and aligning that with a shared strategic plan that can be signed off and adopted by agency leadership and then incorporated into every organization's strategic plan. Secondarily, but related, is that need for that countywide performance indicator dashboard. If we are only looking at the needs and challenges and opportunities through the lens of one industry sector, we cannot see the whole picture of what is truly happening as we serve these individuals and help them advance in their well-being journey. 
the priority recommendations for access in the care continuum tie back to a very significant challenge this community has faced for the last 15 years. And by far the largest number of recommendations are tied to overall access in our care continuum. But it has been 15 years since the state of Ohio closed Twin Valley Behavioral Health, which was our region's state psychiatric facility. Upon that closure, our region was given assurances that our patients would be able to be transferred to facilities in Toledo, Columbus, and Cincinnati. That process has never worked smoothly to serve the needs of our region or the individuals in our care, and our community members are paying that price. Through the course of our task force discussions, as well as individual meetings with stakeholders, it has been made clear that the process to transfer patients to the state psychiatric facilities is so broken that organizations are no longer tracking or documenting the series of failed attempts to transfer patients to those facilities. Our region deserves better, and we will develop a proposal to articulate our needs and expectations clearly to Governor DeWine, Director Chris, and our region's legislative delegation. We have waited 15 years for the state of Ohio to help us fill this gap and hole in our community, and that wait ends with, this, with the launch of the Behavioral Health Task Force recommendations. Of critical importance is addressing the significant the significant behavioral health needs of our individuals in the Montgomery County's jail. That announcement was made last week, and while that investment is important, we also need to look at the interim period between now and when that facility comes <coughs> online for the additional beds to ensure that we have a plan in the interim to serve those individuals' needs. The priority recommendations to data and technology are items that we've alluded to already, and we have a significant opportunity to invest in the connectivity and infrastructure that we use to drive data decisions about what type of care, where that care is located, and how our behavioral health needs are addressed. We have essentially two key aspects to consider when we are thinking about data. One is what I alluded to with the oversight and leadership recommendations, the aggregate data for all partners to be able to drive policy change, align strategy, and secure programmatic as well as capital funding investments is critical for our region to advance. As well as individually, the data connectivity between partner organizations so that an individual's care plan can be followed and that there will be no wrong door for an individual preventing them from continuing their well-being or recovery. Many of the most challenging decisions right now regarding how to serve the needs of our community are tied to holistic workforce conversations across the behavioral health continuum. Every agency, organization, and partner is struggling to find and retain the workforce needed to serve this population. Again, we need to develop solutions by using the data from all partners and overlaying that with the academic programs in our region to better understand how we need to prepare to meet the needs of today and tomorrow. One of the clinical specialties that we rely on incredibly in this region is psychiatry. And prior to COVID-19, we already knew that there was a gap in terms of the demand for services and the available psychiatric clinicians in this region. That demand is continuing to increase. Psychiatry is critical to the model of care that allows us to use other licensed individuals under their supervision, and we need to expand the number of placements at Wright State University Boonshoff School of Medicine so that we can do everything that we can to keep them here in this region for practicing psych psychiatric care in the future. We are facing a national shortage for psych psychiatry in the coming years, and now is the time to develop the tools and models to be ready to serve our communities when that shortage arrives. Finally, advocacy and public awareness. The state and federal government are preparing to make new investments through a variety of funding streams. <clears throat> we must ensure that Montgomery County and our collaborative partnerships are ready and in the queue to match local investments to access those state funds and federal funds in order to achieve our shared vision. If we do so in partnership with one another, we will transform that delivery and we will just transform the delivery of behavioral health services in our region. And we must be prepared to advocate for the needs of our residents together. 
developing a shared county and regional advocacy agenda for behavioral health is critical to our shared success. Our leaders and policymakers must know that we are working as one team to better serve individuals on their journey in behavioral health. Again, access to state psychiatric hospital placements is critical to ensuring that the right level of care is provided at the right location at the right time. We must also address the inadequacy of reimbursement for behavioral health services, which impacts every provider in their ability to expand services, as well as retain the necessary high-performing staff. And there is an opportunity to be, to be ready for expanding outpatient services, which is critically important to helping individuals receive support, care, and treatment before they are in a crisis. And as Haley alluded to, as we enter the fall, there is still work to be done. In preparation for 2024, we will transition the list of recommendations into an actionable implementation plan. That will allow us to look at the strategic actions needed for a recommendation to come into fruition, understanding how organizations in the community are equipped to facilitate, lead, or support that work, and develop cost estimates for future budget conversations. From an education perspective, we are returning some time to our provider partners, particularly in the healthcare space, while we provide continuing education for them and their staff in behavioral health, focused on creating access to comprehensive, high-quality behavioral health care services. And of course, we will engage individuals with lived experience and their loved ones to learn more about their experience with the behavioral health continuum in our community. Thank you for the opportunity to work with all of you as well as your county staff and my colleague, Haley Coretta. She has been a phenomenal representative of Montgomery County. And now I would like to introduce CJ Kosteka, the uh, Associate Chief Nursing Officer for Miami Valley Hospital. Thanks, Sarah. Wow, it seems like it's been years ago since I saw you, but it's only been a short eight months ago that I came to you. And I felt like at that point in time, I was in um, a mode of desperation um, and a lack of hope. Today, I come to you after being a part of this behavioral task force with a renewed spirit um, and mindset that there is hope. Um, I have been challenged by some of my peers that are on this task force to look at what we're doing differently. I've built relationships with individuals um, from the court system, from our jails, from the Adamus Ward, and everything that we have come back to was about the patient. How do we do things differently? How do we work differently and collaborate together? Because that is the only reason that we are here, right? Is for our community, for our patients. It's our duty, obligation, it is what I went to nursing for, is to care for our patients in our community. And I firmly believe that. And I believe after this task force, there is renewed hope. I know Sarah alluded to a couple of things that are near and dear to my heart. It is about the violence that we were experiencing on the behavioral health unit. We're still experiencing that. Mm -hmm. But as I know that as we move down through one of these recommendations, I really feel we're going in the right direction and our patients are gonna get the level of care that they need. And I just want to say thank you for your time um, and for your support and your willingness to help support this endeavor and most importantly, our patients in our community. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would also like to introduce Stephen O'Neill uh, with Kettering Health. Stephen O'Neill, Chief Nursing Officer, Kettering Health, Miamisburg, and I'm the Executive Overseas Kettering Health Behavioral Medical Center. So thank you. Uh, it wasn't without your support that this didn't get started. Uh, the great opportunity I've had to work, of course, with Haley and Sarah um, is amazing. Uh, but also what we found was the opportunity to start linking hands across competitive lines. Mm -hmm. My colleague CJ and I have the opportunity to, to spend time together to understand that we have so many things in similar challenges, uh, but also with our court systems and our legal system. In order to get anywhere, if you're a backpacker or a traveler, you must first know where you start. We finally figured out where we're starting from. 
um, as we dug, we kept digging deeper to realize that our system is broken. This is a highly vulnerable part of our population and one that our court systems are taking care of but aren't designed to take care of. The mental health environment is one that is very sensitive and it is one that, for lack of any direction, has been left behind. Your support in this process has allowed us to take time to focus in to determine where do we need to go from here and to develop a plan that can start to take care of that population that has been left behind for so long. It wouldn't have been without having eight months ago come to this room and your support through funding, but also giving us the bandwidth to do it. So I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. All right, commissioners, okay. yeah. do you have any questions, yeah. comments? Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you working together and you can see it's so important to our community. So <clears throat> thank you and I'm looking forward to the next steps. And I know Commissioner Rice, you've been very involved in going to the meetings. And I think I see Judge David Brannon sitting back there. Uh, thank you, Judge Brannon. You've been very much an instrumental part of this. So thank you. Thank all of you. Couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. I would definitely, uh, I did observe and witness and participate. Uh, I don't think I was able to attend every meeting, but I think I only missed one. Um, and so uh, I can say firsthand that the room uh, probably is met, probably more people than are in this room today uh, were in every meeting. And um, the true dedication to the uh, most vulnerable population was palpable in every meeting. I was in a lot of the, um, um, what do I always say, activities where you got into deeper discussions and, um, you know, just reinforced that uh, I hope we're truly all on the same page. I think we all believed we were, but um, by having that shared experience and uh, we're all in the same boat and we uh, want the same thing. We want our uh, these citizens to have the bright future they deserve with the right treatment, with the right medications, uh, with the right options. Uh, there will be a better future for them, their families, but most importantly, our entire community because it is truly not having them is doing so much harm. Uh, and I think that we will be a stronger voice. Uh, I know everyone's been advocating. It's not that we haven't advocated. But I think if we're all, I believe we will be more on the same page, um, more uh, clear in what our priorities are, and really holding our um, representatives accountable uh, to help us find solutions. Uh, we're not unique. Uh, when we go to NACO and other um, conferences, this is across the country. It's not unique to Ohio. But that's no excuse for us not to find the best possible solutions uh, right here for our community. And there are other ideas in other communities that we can try to emulate. Uh, but my hat's off to every individual that was part of that task force, every individual who wasn't there but who responded to the survey with their honest critiques and their insights, uh, because I know people who are on the front line of this issue know better than the rest of us. Uh, not only the harm that it's doing, but what's really, really needed. Uh, and I, I'm excited. Uh, as I, as our last session, you know, to me, this is just the beginning. And I hope that these relationships will only grow stronger uh, because there is so much work to be done. Uh, we need more people in this space helping our um, citizens build a better future. So. Thank you. Um, I think we feel really good about the investment that we made and that we can um, step into this space and really find a brighter future for our community. So it was an honor to uh, even observe and listen and um, be able to witness uh, this collaboration become, is taking it up a different level. I, I always say that we collaborate in this community but when, when you're around a crisis, there's something that comes um, to the forefront. Uh, I think it brings out the best in all of us. And we're not there. We're not saying we've achieved uh, anything yet. Uh, but I feel very much stronger that we are on our way and that whatever obstacles come our way, 
together we can figure it out and we will be a stronger community in the mental health space, both in this Montgomery County in this region, but the state of Ohio in the years to come because nothing is gonna stop us from going forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. You know, um, Haley, when you, it is a crisis and it's a national crisis, as Carolyn said. Um, it's a public health crisis. And we know it was bad before the pandemic and now everything from our youngest mm -hmm. babies to our senior citizens, it's affecting everyone. And so I know when it was last year, before we pulled everybody together, we talked about this and it's like, we have so many great things going on. So that wasn't, this wasn't mm -hmm. done to say that, well, so-and-so isn't doing this and they're not doing this. No, this was collaboration. And we know in this community, whenever we um, collaborate, do collective impact around something so important, we did it around homelessness, we've done it around so many things, food, um, ex offenders. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, just, yeah, drug, right, uh, coat. So I thank all of you that are in here who are, have been committed to this and will continue to be committed to it. Uh, we all know somebody that's affected by mental health issues and it's not their fault. We know that. And so as we look at next steps and we're gonna be innovative as a community, I know we will be, uh, but Sarah, one of the things that came to mind when you said next steps and when we look at what we are going to do at the jail, and we're excited about that, but what are we going to do with stop gaps? So hopefully that um, smart minds can come together around that and we can figure out a way to make sure that everybody that comes in there is getting the treatment they need and that they're, they're, not only will they be safe, but our, our um, corrections officers and deputies will be safe as well. And that's just one little piece. And you know, as we look at all the different nonprofits and different organizations that are, are growing and popping up, let's just make sure that everybody's at that table. And I know you will. And I really wanna thank you, Sarah. This was a big lift. And to the team that helped you, thank you as well. And I, of course, Haley, you're the best. Thank you. <laughs> so Michael, do you have anything to add? I do. Thank you, commissioners. Um, Haley and Sarah, again, leadership, leadership always counts. Commissioners, thank you for committing the resources to this. Uh, it was a big budget lift, so thank you uh, to both our large hospital associations, but also to the smaller providers like Haven and 115 mm -hmm. that were at the table. Our goal in this was to hear from the providers. We wanted to hear from the people that treat people and then bringing in our court, Judge Brannon, and our sheriff, uh, Rob Streck, into the full conversation. Our goal was to hear from everyone at this. Uh, I'm excited about what we can put behind the recommendations, because I'm looking forward to that continuum. Um, and, and we have made a commitment to support the recommendations, so we will implement. Uh, I'm also excited about where the data and the technology can take us, the work with Ascend. Uh, mm -hmm. That is the future. And uh, we'll be working with the state, uh, both Medicaid and OMAS. Um, and that's, that's gonna be a real big lift. But uh, I think if we continue to work together, uh, this will be positive. So thank you, uh, Sarah and Haley, for your leadership. Um, thank both of our nursing doctors, or doctor nurses, <laughs> if I didn't get that right. Um, and then all of our providers that were at the table. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners, administrators, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have several resolutions for your approval today. First is resolution 23-1256 to authorize the county auditor to pay by warrant $93,243.66 to the city of Centerville for permissive tax funds for the 2021 Wilmington Pike resurfacing project. 1257 is to revise the prima facie speed limit on Lions Road from Lions Ridge Drive to Yankee Street in Washington Township in accordance with section 4511.21 of the Ohio Revised Code. And then we have a couple of agreements with American Structure Point Inc. for design engineering services. Uh, the first is 1258 
for the Westbrook Road bridge reconstruction project in the city of Brookville in an amount not to exceed $285,373 through December 31st of 2027. And 1259 is for the Crestway Road bridge reconstruction project in the city of Clayton in an amount not to exceed $272,875 through December 31st of 2026. Move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. County Sheriff. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners. Under the County Sheriff, we have Resolution 1260, accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Public Safety, Ohio Traffic Safety Office for High Visibility Enforcement Overtime Program in the amount of $106,720.82. We also have Resolution 1261, authorize a purchase from GO Buyer Son Holding LLC, DBA Buyers Ford for three, 2023 Ford police interceptive vehicles in an amount not to exceed 139,272 through December 31st, 2023. I move to approve. Second. Well, there there is a late item. Late item. Okay. Sure. And then the late item. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> we have a late item, 1292, except a grant from the Ohio Department of Public Safety, Recovery Ohio Major Drug Interdiction, <laughs> Ohio Organized Crime Investigations Commission in the amount of 121,647 and 16 cents. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Common Pleas Court. Thank you, commissioners. Under the Court of Common Pleas and the Common Pleas Court, we have Resolution 1262 authoriz authorizing a memorandum of understanding with Alcohol, Drug, and Addiction and Mental Health Services for the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for uh, state fiscal year 2024 community allocation guidelines in the amount of 200,000. We also have resolution 1263 amend the addendum to the agreement with the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, Division of Patrol, Parole and Community Services. Mm -hmm. Move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Probate court. Under the probate court, we have resolution 1264 authorize a re renewal option with Tiber. RIA Development Group, Inc. for software and services to extend the existing e-filing system in the amount not to exceed 45320 through August 30th, 2024. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks for being here, Judge Brandon. We, we usually would make you come up here and do your own, but since there was only one, you know. Thank you for Oh, you're welcome. Juvenile Court. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, before I read the resolution on behalf of Juvenile Court, in response to your comment last meeting, commission meeting, uh, uh, the, the judges, Judge Wallace and Judge Bruns and uh, Court Administrator Eric Schaefer um, appreciates our relationship with the commissioners and with the county, OMB, and we were just at a state meeting uh, last week and they heard about some of the turmoil that some of the mm -hmm. states have with, what some of the counties have with the the courts, so we appreciate our relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So resolution 23-1265, uh, uh, we recommend that you adopt the budget based on a grant with the Ohio Department of Youth Services for the ongoing operation of the Center for Adolescent Services in the amount of $5,860,541 through June 30th, 2024. Move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And you know, that center is so important and it's kind of quiet that it's here in Montgomery County, but we're really thankful and, and they do a, well, a very difficult job, but they do a good job. So thank you. Please convey our thanks to the judges too. We appreciate the relationship between the court and children's services. So thank you. Yes, thanks. Okay, auditor's office. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, under the auditor's office, we have authorization of purchases through December 31st, 2023. Resolution 1266, New Horizons for the online SQL program training services in an amount not to exceed $981. Resolution 1267, Terillium for consulting services for payroll department in an amount not to exceed $103,950. And we have one late item. Resolution 1293, authorize an agreement with Iron Bow for the Cybersecurity Solution Project in an amount not to exceed $835,279.84 through December 31st, 2026, with options to renew. I move for approval. 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. You know, I just want to point out on 93, it's such a shame that we have to, as not just us, all over the world has to, has to do this now. Um, Absolutely, Commissioners. This is actually part of a much larger cybersecurity project that we're going to do. Uh, when it's all said and done with the renewals, with the options, we'll probably be closer to a million dollars. But all governments are, are mm -hmm. going to have to and make this investment. Yep. We're fortunate that we've got ARPA dollars that allow us to do this right now, and For we now. can set the stage. Yeah. So thank you. to Michael. <laughs> Thank you, commissioners. Under the county administrator, under the clerk of the commission, we have approved the minutes of the meetings on September 19th, 2023, resolution 1268, approval of bills, resolution 1269, approval of travel and expenses, resolution 1270, approval of personnel actions. All three of those lists are available in the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Administrative services, Tyler. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We have five resolutions for your consideration today, beginning with 1271. <coughs> this resolution authorizes a master, a master solutions agreement with Central Square Technologies, LLC, for ongoing utility building software and upgrades for the Environmental Services Department. Resolution 1272, amends resolution number 23-1171, which authorized a City of Dayton parking agreement for the Business Services Department by adding $1,500 for a revised total of $5,100. 1273 adopts revisions to the purchasing policy and procedures established by resolution 80-988, increasing the competitive bidding threshold to $75,000. Resolution 1274 authorizes the purchase of a Stero conveyor dishwasher and installation services from SS Kemp and Company and LLC for the Stillwater Center in an amount not to exceed $70,050. And last is resolution 1275. Uh, this resolution uh, is to solicit requests for qualifications for professional design services for the jail mental health, detox, and behavioral health units project. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, before you approve, uh, Tyler, you want to walk us through uh, the set of next steps as it relates to the new unit that we're building in the jail. Absolutely. So this Friday, a request for qualifications for design will be released to the public. Uh, we'll be open for a period of time. Uh, various architectural firms will um, submit for that. Once that's uh, once we collect those, we will select a designer for the jail. Um, this project will be delivered using a construction manager at risk model. So soon after we bring the designer on board, we will release another RFQ for uh, construction services from our construction manager at risk, and then those two entities will work together to uh, design um, and put together a construction plan for the jail. Uh, we would expect the design um, to be completed sometime in the latter part of next year. And then once we complete that, we'll have a good idea of how long the construction mm -hmm. timeline will be. Great. Thank you. I move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And on 74, <coughs> I just wanted to say that is one expensive dishwasher. However, we know that everything at Stillwater is expensive. And Yes. It's 24 hours that dishwasher's yeah. going, so. And it's for 94 to 98 of our residents. I so know. That's I a lot of people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything costs a lot. All right. Uh, environmental Services, Matt. Good afternoon, Commissioners. For Environmental Services, we have Resolution 1276, amend the Environmental Services Municipal Indust Industrial Pretreatment <laughs> Program local limits for the Western Regional water reclamation facility. The next five are to amend agreements. Resolution 1277 with CG Construction and Utilities Inc. for construction of the Regent Water Main Replacement Project by adding $68,680.92 to the original amount for a revised total of $2,298,540.92. Twelve seventy eight with Black and Beach Corp for the preparation of detailed construction plans and specifications for the Eastern Standby Generator Replacement Project by adding one hundred twenty nine thousand nine hundred forty two dollars to the original amount for a revised total of seven hundred nine seven hundred twenty three thousand three hundred ninety six dollars and extending the term through December thirty first twenty twenty four. 1279 with Milcon Concrete Inc. for the Stop 8 Lift Station and Force Main Replacement Project by adding $3,051.34 to the original amount 
for a revised total of $599,331.34. $1280 with Double J Construction Incorporated for construction of the Delwood Estates Water Main Replacement Project by deducting $39,415.94 from the original amount for a revised total of $682,262.06. And 1281 with AMG Incorporated for preparation of detailed construction plans and specifications for the compliance project arc flash assessment by adding $55,267.62 to the original amount for a revised total of $628,152.97. And the last four are to issue renewed authorizations to discharge wastewater permits to significant industrial users discharging to the Western Regional Water Reclamation Facility, 1282 with Fui Out Glass America, 1283 with Veolia ES Technical Services, 1284 with West, Paper, West Carrollton Paper, and 1285 with Valley Corps Environmental Services. Motion I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Human Services, Jerry. Yes, we have a resolution under Human Services Plan Development, Resolution 231286, submit a consolidated application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the OH505 Dayton Kettering Montgomery County Continuum of Care in an amount of $13,913,099. And this is our plan that supports our homeless solutions continuum of services mm -hmm. within our community. So we're very excited um, to submit the plan mm -hmm. and application. Great, thank you. We also have a late agenda item, which is under the Department of Job and Family Services, Resolution 231294 which authorizes the advertisement and opening of a 30-day public comment period for the proposed federal fiscal year 2024-2025 Prevention, Retention, and Contingency, or PRC, plan through October 31st of 2025. Um, I move for approval, and, and I must just say, with my work on the Homeless Solutions Policy Board, a lot of, lot of, lot of work goes into uh, each of those so um, hats off always to everyone involved for their years and years of uh, passion for this issue and determination to find solutions mm -hmm. and it's one of those things 20 mm -hmm. years ago we looked at it as a community yeah. and so we need to eliminate <coughs> chronic homelessness in our county and we're still working at it we're but still working at it but it sure is a big difference when you look at other metro counties yeah. throughout not just ohio but I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Business Solutions, Chris. Thank you, Commissioners. Under Business Services, I have three resolutions for you. First two, 1287, authorize an agreement with Jennifer Cotouche to provide veterinary services for the Animal Resource Center in the Mountain Atlantic Sea, $49,900 through December 31st, 2024. 1288, authorize an interagency agreement with the Office of Strategic Initiatives for Justice Web Interactions and Reports for the Animal Resource Center through December 31st, 2033. And the last one under Community Economic Development, 1289, authorize the assignment of all documents from County Court Development to County Corp as related to Housing Development Action Grants. Move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 1289, that's, that's big. We mm -hmm. knew it was coming, but interesting that the, that but for that change and then the other one is um, the vet services is Jennifer additional no it, you might remember she was a full-time vet at the ARC uh, she has since moved on but she's still providing consultant services okay. and licensure for the okay. animal so resource we're still looking for another vet. that is correct anybody knows any veterinarians out there call Chris Um, under the county commissioners, we have 23-1290, and that is to appoint Grady Mullins to the Greater Dayton Regional Transit Authority Board of Trustees through September 29th of 2026, and 1291 is to reappoint Sharon White, still seems so weird to call her that, 
Sharon White to the Greater Dayton Regional Transit Authority Board of Trustees for a three-year term ending September 29th of 2026. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We do have several citizens signed up to speak. Uh, Mr. Feaster, we're going to start with you. Why don't you come on up? <coughs> Willie Feaster. Once again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on this four, East 4th Street in Jefferson, downtown Dayton, Ohio. You know, I could come up every week and speak about this here, you know, because this problem been going on for decades. I came to Dayton, Ohio in 1999, and it was a problem down here on 3rd and Main, and it's still a problem. It took two shootings, since the last time I come here to talk, two people to get shot before they put some police down there for one day. One day they flooded downtown with police officers. And they put up uh, some more cameras. Cameras ain't gonna deter them kids down there from fighting, shooting dice, creating havoc. They don't care about them cameras. But I'm, 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 the question I'm asking you, commissioners, city, mayor, all them old people, what is y'all gonna do, man, to address this issue? We just gonna keep talking, talking, talking. Every week, every week, nothing ever get done. What is it gonna take, man? How many people got to get beat up? What is it going to take? How many people got to get? They don't have one homicide downtown. What is it going to take, Deborah Limited? What is it going to take? I'll address it to you and Michael Corbett. What is it going to take? Oh, Willie, we got things coming. Always oh, get that on. Man, stop it. It's always <laughs> people steady getting their ass whooped. People scared to walk down the street. People come out to my rich apartment, $2,000 a month. Scared. Sneak out. Scared to walk across the street. You got a hundred kids acting up, smoking dope, shooting dice, everything. It affects everybody. They shouldn't have to go through that. When they get up in the first in the morning, open up the window, what do they see? A hundred kids out there acting up. Girls twerking, girls squeezing on each other's booties, boys fighting over girls, girls fighting over boys. That's all they see all day long. When they doing they shooting dice. When they doing that, they smoking dope. When they underage kids, when is they gonna address this here, man? What is it going to take? Another homicide? Michael Corbin? Debbie? You know? Because Michael Corbin, you said things is changing. Things, what is changing? They put up a camera. What is a camera? What is that going to stop them kids from acting up? When is they going to put some police officers down there? That's what's happening. When is they going to spend some money and put some police officers? I don't even stay down there, but I'm still concerned. It don't affect me. But I'm still concerned. I'm speaking for the people scared to come down here and speak. I'm speaking for the people that don't even believe in y'all. Feel it's hopeless to come down and speak to y'all. I'm speaking for them rich white folks that stay in them apartments, $2,000 a month, that's scared to come out at nighttime, scared to come out in the daytime, they scared. You ever been down to the devil limit and see when they come out, they ease out the door and eat because they scared. Some of them would love to go in the in and out and get something out of that store. Right in front of but they can't. Even they put the bricks up. You seen the bricks up? And they all congregate on the bricks now. So what is y'all gonna do something, man, to address this issue? I'm talking about the city, the county, the police, the sheriff, all of y'all got to be a part of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Visa. We've hit the three minute timeline. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Thank you. Mr. Visa, I'm gonna address two of your comments though. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. The first is uh, week after week after week, you have, you have come here to address both the library security and the downtown Dayton security, neither of which are under the jurisdiction of the county. The county has no authority over the library. The library has a separate board and a separate executive director, and they have their own security apparatus that protects all of the libraries. We have no authority to patrol the libraries. Additionally, Downtown Dayton is within the jurisdiction of the city of Dayton. The city of Dayton commission and the city of Dayton manager is who you need to talk to about downtown Dayton policing. Uh, we are already the county, the sheriff, if you will, their purview are the townships and the jail. And we are already stretched thin patrolling the townships and the jail. So my advice to you would be to take this to the Dayton City Commission 
and also take this to the library board and have those discussions with the appropriate officials. Thank you, Mr. Priester. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Destiny Brown, come on up. Give us your name, address, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Commission. Thank you for your time. My name is Destiny Brown. Um, I am at uh, 132nd Street, Dayton, Ohio. Um, I'm a community organizer with Able Law Firm. I'm also a member of the Montgomery County Jail Coalition. Um, we represent the interests and concerns of over 300 Dayton residents. Um, residents who are impacted by the Montgomery County Jail, citizens who have interest in this space. And as such, we are here to express our concern about the transparency process and the most recent decisions around the county jail. <clears throat> Primarily, some of the concerns that came up in our group is that there, the public interest was a concern, despite years of explicit promise to the contrary. Each, each, each one of you, or at least at minimum, on a public front have expressed that there would be a transparent process, that there would be convening of public forums, town halls on the issue, and that um, our county would take into heed impacted in individuals when it came to decisions around the county jail. Consistently, it was said that there was nothing to talk about when there were questions from our group about the updates on what was happening with decisions around the jail. And most recently, we've learned, specifically this past Friday, that obviously some definitive plans were put in place. It is disappointing that it seems that efforts to keep the community under wraps about, the, about plans regarding the jail were kept from public interest. Planning was conducted in secret. We didn't know what the planning process was, except that it seems that NAFCARE and Gadaha were at the table conducting research and shaping the outcome. In addition to the exclusion from the, the most recent press conference, um, which alleg allegedly there was space considerations, which is why our co coalition could not be present. The event happened in this room, which, which seemed to be able to accommodate. Tuesday meetings are are prohibitively inaccessible to a lot of people who are impacted by this issue. The events um, and the regular meetings are a challenge for people to come to considering they work and these are everyday citizens who don't have capacity to be here and can't express their concerns. The commission spent a great deal of time on routine meetings in executive session, deliberation does not occur in public. It seems that the Open Meetings Act is not taken seriously. It is understood that this is a vulnerable population when we talk about the Montgomery County Jail and that many people are suffering from mental health and drug abuse or disorders. It's, it's validated, obviously, to take the jail from 12 beds to 112. However, it is still disheartening that it is that mental health is criminalized and that for many people, they still have to be incarcerated to get, to get the health care that they need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple things in there I'd like to address. I know my county minister doesn't want me to open my mouth, but I'm going to because, okay, uh, you know, and you can sit down, that's fine. Um, first of all, <laughs> We have, we, we're not building a giant jail. That's what I heard from you guys for a couple years. Don't build a giant jail, don't build a giant jail. We kept telling you, we're looking at this. We don't think we can afford it. We also did share many times, I think probably each one of the four of us talked about what we were going to do with the sheriff in the jail to provide help for all of our people with mental health issues. And I'm not sure how you wanted us to do anything differently. Um, you asked when, you, when you're gonna make your announcement, when you're gonna make your announcement. We made our announcement last Friday. And as you heard Tyler say, we, we don't have a plan yet. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going out for bids on Friday. So we, while I do appreciate uh, your interest and your concern, we've heard you from the very beginning and I'm not sure which one of us said we were going to have a town hall. That, that's kind of news to me, but I know you had many town halls about it. 
and we're not on we're not on opposite ends here. And I think I've said that to you before as a body. We're on the same, we, we believe the same thing you do. However, what do you think county commissioners could do about criminalizing mental health? That comes through the courts. And, and when people, unfortunately, are, are, there are judges are sending people there, our police officers, others are bringing people in we don't make that call. We can't make that criminalization call. So with the lack of places, and, and I think if you were listening to Haley, you heard, or I'm sorry, Sarah, when we closed Twin Valley, we started to have a crisis in our community. We didn't close Twin Valley, nor could we afford to open up a <coughs> facility that would house those people. And a lot of the people that were at Twin Valley were there because they were court ordered to be there in the forensic unit. So I know you guys have experts in, uh, in nursing, and we're gonna hear from Yvonne next. But again, we're not on opposite sides with this. However, and I've said this to many of you before, we are not gonna fix a jail. I used to say build a jail, but now we're not gonna fix, repair, uh, whatever word we want to call it, by a committee. You know, it, we can't do that. It's not feasible or possible. We have had experts looking at this for several years now, and I know then no one liked what HDR came up with. Either did we. We didn't either. We never said we're going to do everything they said. So, again, <laughs> instead of this constant confrontation and anger at us for trying to do the right thing, I'm really disappointed. You know, I invited many of, all of you, uh, to come here listening from mm -hmm. the National Association of Counties. Some of you did come, and I appreciate that. And we talked, and we shared in that. But again, we, we don't do our work, and, and especially in building or things like that, by committee. The sheriff is the one that knows best what needs to be in the jail. There are experts in this field. So again, I, I really appreciate you all. I appreciate your concern. Everything I've read, there, whether it's ABLE, whether it's our P public defender's office, on and on and on, you guys, we agree with you. And this is a national crisis. So let's figure out a way to be cordial, work together, and not be adversarial. That's my two cents. Sorry, Michael. No, no, go ahead, uh, Commissioner. Okay. I will. I will wait until after all the jail committees speak, and I'll tie it all together. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne Carrington. Please come up, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. I'm Yvonne Currington, 250 Trail Woods Drive, Dayton, Ohio, 45415. Three minutes isn't long enough for me to say what I have to say, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm unhappy, the, the thing I'm unhappy, I'm happy that you're doing this with the, with the jail. I've told you that, Debbie. Um, I think it's a great idea and it's a great use of the ARPA funds. Um, I'm unhappy that that our group who's been meeting for almost four years wasn't included in the, when you when you met with Gadaha and whoever else was in the group. Um, the, the thing I find about people who are poor or people who are in jail, those of us that aren't poor and aren't in the jail, we come up with ideas about what we think they need, but we never ask them. We never ask the community. Um, I would like to have been a part of that community. Uh, I don't see this group that you just had, they're not community per se. They're all CEOs, presidents, whatever, judges, just like the Justice Committee was. I was the only person from the community who was on the Justice Committee and that was because I imposed myself as the League of Women Voters uh, observer, not because I was asked or anybody else who has any direct experience. And I worked in ERs for 27 years in this town, so I have some experience with these same people that we're talking about. Um, 
I'm not happy that NAVCARE is going to be the, the group that's providing the treatment because they're not providing decent care. And I'm not saying that the, the employees aren't great. Mm -hmm. Nurses will break their backs to make sure that pay, people get what they need. Mm -hmm. But when you only got three RNs on day shift and you got 600 plus inmates and they're as sick as all of you said they were when you had your press conference, there's no way that you can provide decent treatment for them. No way. And NAVCARE is a for-profit. They're in the business to make money, just like insurance companies. They're not. And so I can't see how this is going to be, uh, I don't know how they're going to staff this new facility. Um, I was looking through the, the um, report from the Justice Committee refreshing my memory in mental health. One of the things they suggested was to have uh, rotations of interns, residents, and social workers and nurses and whoever else to come through the, the jail as a rotation, as a clinical experience that would help um, maybe improve the, the appearance of, of working there. I've not heard that ever brought up, so I don't know if it's ever happened or not, but there's just so many other things that, that we could do, and sometimes I think the, the general community ought to be included in these decisions instead of the people who are in high power seats, you know, being the only ones who, who look at the data and make the decisions. Um, so I'm out of time, I, but okay, when you say the community should be able to make the decision, how do you see that working? Some members from our group would be a part of the of, be a part of the decision making process to have input. Mm -hmm. Because when I first took got on the justice committee, I wasn't um, I couldn't speak because I was a League of Women Voters observer, but that's how I got in the room. Mm -hmm. And eventually, it took a few months, but eventually I was included mm -hmm. and, and was put on committees and things like that. But so people who have direct experience actually working with these folks, maybe ought to, or, you know, have interest in, in working with them, ought to be able to be included. Certainly. And I heard you say that the people that were on that committee and then on this most latest, the Jaha, lack of a better word, uh, committee, weren't people from the community and you know Rabbi Barsky and Gary LaRoy were the chairs and I mean if anybody knows the community it would be those two people and so I'm not disputing this with you you and I have talked about this before and I just I agreed at the time that you should have had a voice and eventually you're right you've got one and then with this most recent Gadaha Haley, how many people were on that committee? Probably close to 20. Yeah. Yeah. And they were from the community that works the most with the people that need the help. So, Commissioner, none of them were hospital CEOs. No. They were no. all health That's providers. The and yeah. yeah. They yeah. were the pro people who provide direct line behavior health, health care. Yeah. And we tasked this committee for that very reason. We had already heard from the public through the Justice Committee. We wanted to hear from those individuals that are treating, including the jail and the probate court. And so we didn't have some high level people on here. Yeah. This was, these were people actually, when you think of 115 and, and Woodhaven and Haven and you know Samaritan Health, uh, these are people actually given care mm -hmm. uh, at the grassroots level. And they were also people from the community. So, yeah. no, but, but, the, but the people in the Justice Committee were CEOs. They were, they were lawyers. They were um, law enforcement. They weren't the average, you know, like me, a retired RN for 45 years experience. They, they weren't, it yeah. wasn't quite the same in my view as having, having people from the community. Yvonne, when I tend to disagree with you, we had Branford mm. Brown. We have a whole list of the people yes, that were there. Yes, and he was an attorney too. Yeah, but he was also he represented. Yeah, he, not only does he know the system, at the time he was representing the Urban League, which okay. is of the community. So, I, and he I, at legal aid. I, mean, I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, when we when we when those people were chosen, there was thought, thought a lot of thought behind it. Um, the people that work most with the jail. Right. But he didn't work in an ER <laughs> <No>. <laughs> with no. these same people. Right. 
before, during, and after incarceration. Exactly. You know, so exactly. there's a little bit that could be have been added. But I'm I'm not here to I'm just here to state my position and I would like to ask that you think about including the, the public a little more. And I know these are people that live in the community. They're community members, but but they're not it's I don't know how to describe it. They're they're in positions and they're fine. I'm not disputing that, but just add a few um, public okay. community members. Thank you and allow us to come to press conferences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one of the things that was talked about was um, <laughs> treating men and women that come into the jail, and because when they come in, we don't know what medications they're on. They usually don't know. Well, it's something for depression, but they don't know what it is, right? So that's a, and I'm not saying NAF care right or wrong, and, and what you said is we do have great employees, and they are going to have to grow that with that many beds, but um, one of the things that the Skadaha group and everybody looked at was how can we get the records and how can we know what those people need? And so we're very hopeful about that. We're also very hopeful that um, the state has to give a waiver, but the federal government has said, well, Ohio, you're an expanded, you're a, a Medicaid expanded state, and therefore we can use Medicaid dollars to uh, treat people that are in the jail. So that's, that's brewing. It should happen very soon. The state just has to say to the feds, okay, we, want, we will do that. So that will be big as far as treating people, but I think that the technology that those next steps that we need that are going to be all part of what Tyler's putting out on Friday to, to be able when people come in we'll know this is this is how Kettering treated them in the past or this is how 115 treated them in the past and then we won't have that time period because believe me I know this Dennis my husband is a criminal defense attorney and I can't tell you how many well, right now he's got nine people I think in the jail and when they have mental health issues, they're just lost. And that's not to blame NAFCARE or anybody else. It's because we don't, we as jail don't have their background information. You know, people don't come in, well, here's my medications and this is what I need. So we are very hopeful that this is gonna work, guys. And, and I, you know, we want you to be supportive. And I appreciate that you're supportive of this step. Um, and we'll just see, we'll be positive <coughs> and know that the next steps are going to be the right thing to do. So one more person, Joel, um, Joel Proust, come on up. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Joel Proust. I live at uh, 232 Park Drive in Dayton. Um, I teach and work at UD and I'm a, a member of the Montgomery County Jail Coalition. Um, I, the first thing that strikes me is how anyone could have listened to my colleague Destiny speak and call her angry. And I don't. I, I didn't call Destiny angry. You okay. guys have been angry with us in the past. I she spoke calm. eloquently I, I and calmly, I and you said she was I'm angry. Sorry, Joel. No, no, I didn't say. So that's the first thing. This is my okay. time. Okay. You can have an extra minute. I appreciate no that. I mean, the other thing is like I, we're just playing games here, you know. And I know that you know that, right? Like, I had coffee with Rabbi Barsky earlier this year, and I said, you know, they say that the Justice Committee is their example of public input. And he chuckled because he said, not only was that not our charge, but it wasn't our process. And in the Justice Committee report, it's like on page three, they tried to do even in interviews with uh, re-entering citizens. They ended up with 11 interviews, and they were anecdotal at best. That's what it says in the Justice Committee report, that you tout as authoritative in this space. Okay, so let's stop playing games about the fact that any part of this process over the last six years has involved people who live in this community, particularly people who are impacted by the system. They know the inside of the system, in fact, better than the sheriff does, and they know what's wrong with it, and they know how to fix it. But we don't engage impacted people, right? We discard them as best as we can. 
And in terms of doing anything by committee, it's called democracy. The idea that this body can authorize a $20 million expenditure without any public input, despite the fact that I have in writing the emails that you are all CC'd on when you said, when we have a plan, we will have public input. We will gather public input. Kevin Lavoy, is that his name? He's in your comms team. I looked over those emails. You've said it on recordings. Like, can we stop playing games, please? And actually, like, try to do this together? We've asked for so many years to be included, for this to be a broad public topic. All the ARPA money that came in, there was no public engagement in terms of how to spend that money. The city did that. You hide your meetings on Tuesday afternoon at 1.30 when no working people can come here. You could do that after work hours, and you might actually have more public engagement. So the by committee that is so alarming to you, that is literally what we do here in a democracy, is we have public input that doesn't stop and start at elections. Civic engagement has to be continuous. Right? And the rest of us, we do this on a voluntary basis. I have to leave work to come here, and i got to make up work later. You know, I don't do this for a living, but I have to get out of my work day just to try to participate in my government because the decisions that are being made here are contrary not only to my values but to evidence. Okay? The sheriff at the press conference said, the first time people get care often is in the jail. We could change that by building out community-based infrastructure. The coalition's been calling for that for three years. And the investments we have made in places like Sainese and the Crisis Response Unit and all those things that are coming online, what if those work? And what if we could spend the ARPA money and the opioid settlement money to expand those community-based services so those people never end up in the jail? We could actually treat the, treat the root causes rather than treating the symptoms. And the idea that NAFCARE was involved in every step of this process and serves to benefit from the size of the contract is corrupt, it is crooked, it is straight crooked. And you hid this from everybody for all these months and then NAFCARE is sitting there introducing you know, themselves as a player here. You know, They are responsible for deaths and negligence and deception across the country, including in this county. Sasha Garvin in 2017 called out for NAFCARE help for days when she was suffering from an impacted bowel and the sheriff said she died of an overdose. She did not die of an overdose. NAFCARE is paying out overcharges and negligence and death across this country, and now their contract presumably is going to grow. They're already on, uh, we're on the hook for $13 million a year. The number we still haven't heard is, what is this going to be the size of the NAFCARE contract moving forward? I would like an answer to that question at least. Thank you for your time. I'm good. Is it okay if I stand? more to speak, commissioners? We guys good. Thank you. Okay. It is imperative if this is process is going to continue that we stay in a fact-based world because that is important as you're leveling accusations that just flat out aren't true. The Justice Committee did spend two years and they were of the public, not just of any one community group, but of the entire county. We selected people that were from all walks of life from across the county. And they spent two years, and not only in that two years that they provide a tangible report, a blueprint of which we should work from, but we bolstered that with a consultant, CGL, to help the Justice Committee in the areas that they weren't sure about. From that report, which is public and which is posted online, we also went to HDR. And we posted the HDR report a week after we briefed the county commissioners. So these accusations of corruption, transparent, lack of transparency, uh, having uh, meetings that aren't in the public just flat out aren't true. And I think you're using these things as buzzwords. And I just i am not going to let that rest because it's just not true. You, you, not just you, but everyone in Montgomery County, all citizens, had an opportunity to download the HDR report a week after it was presented to the Board of County Commissioners. One week later, you all had an opportunity, and we have made it clear that we're not gonna just focus with one group or another group, that we want all of our citizens to be informed. Now, we went to the Behavioral Health Task Force because we wanted to hear from the providers of healthcare directly. These were not CEOs or some bigwigs. These were nurses and doctors and people that serve people in behavioral health. We wanted to get their feedback, and we wanted to know how they felt about the system. 
We wanted to know about the data. We wanted to know about the ability of people going through multiple doors. There was no secrecy there. They were all health providers. And we added probate and sheriff because the systems are interchanged. They're in, intertwined. Probate court judges using the pink slip process to mandate medicines or care, and the sheriff being a lot of times the first responders in a behavior health episodic event. As far as the next steps, we have moved the next steps now, as the commissioners have mentioned, and as we've pro uh, moved to RFP, RFQ, on the resolution so that we can get a design for the new unit. We have been doing this now for six years. We have the resources to move forward, we need to get to design, and we need to get the unit up and running. Nobody disputes that. As far as NAFCARE being the, the new boogeyman, we need NAFCARE. NAFCARE is providing, the men and women of NAFCARE are providing behavior health, physical health, mental health services in the jail. That is the fact. Yvonne, you mentioned residencies. We've got two psychiatric residencies going on right now, and we are increasing that to four. <coughs> we don't have three nurses. We have six nurses per shift. So it is important as we lay out these things and that when you come to the podium and address the commission or you want to talk in the media, at a minimum, at least state the facts. There is nothing untransparent about putting the reports on the website so everyone can see it. There's nothing untransparent about letting everyone in the public, not just one group, but everyone know what is going on. Through the next steps of this process, we will go to design. Those designs will be posted to the website. The next step after design will be to select a design through a competitive process, and then we will go into a construction phase. All of this will move, but as commissioners have said, we can't do this through a committee. We've got to move on these things. After six years, we've got to make decisions to move forward. We can't start all over again because now we have a whole new group of people that say, well, you, everything that you did six years ago doesn't matter, or none of those people were of the community. We've got to stay realistic and factually based in order to get this done. We've got to give the sheriff and NAFCARE the tools that they need to treat people. And that is the humane thing that everyone is trying to do. We have got to create a therapeutic environment in the jail. And that is what we are trying to do. So to the commissioner's point, work with us on this. There's nobody trying to do anything here nefarious. But at the same time, you can't make accusations that just aren't based in fact and say they're true. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Michael. Michael, do you have comments <clears throat> besides that? Yes, commissioners. I wanted to remind everyone, thank you, that um, Montgomery County Fall Job Fair is tomorrow, and this is huge. This is one of our largest job fairs from 12 to 4, Dayton Convention Center. Uh, we've got 200 employers that have registered. Uh, most of them will be hiring on the spot. Uh, so it, it is critically important. We've got 400 people, commissioners registered and ready to sign up. Um, the first 600 parking is paid for. Uh, if you don't have a resume and you're not, don't feel like you're ready, please come down anyway. Our team will help you with your resume and our team will get you moving and try to get you employed. So please, uh, anyone out there that's looking for work, please come to the Dayton Convention Center tomorrow uh, from 12 to 4. Thank you, commissioners. That's always a real good one. Yeah, um, we have so many people looking for employees, mm -hmm. and um, there's there's great opportunity. And the hiring on the spot is mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could get a job right then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, September has been um, National Recovery Month, and uh, last night at the Family Treatment Court. Uh, picnic at the Haines Center mm -hmm. um, Family tr Treatment Court um, they had a, a nice event and mm -hmm. they our treatment court is a wonderful pathway for parents to in recovery to regain custody of their children um, you know for whatever reason that they're in recovery um, they still love their children and 
30 program alumni were there last night, along with many of their family members and friends. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the Family Treatment Court is to help parents see that they can overcome their addiction to be happier, healthier, um, a happy, happier and healthier version of themselves while parenting through a sober lens. And so our Family Treatment Court provides customized support to our participants and it connects them with the opportunities that are in our community, multiple treatment options uh, faster, and it provides trauma-informed care for both parents and children. <clears throat> you know, oftentimes people don't even realize the trauma they've been through, and um, both the parents and the children. So that trauma-informed care is so important. And these events can help connect them to the resources to assist with housing, utilities, daycare, and transportation. Um, we, through that process, we can reduce the number of days the children are in out-of-home care and increase the number of children who are able to remain in their homes. So, um, and it also helps the parents with those barriers that are out there uh, for treatment, for working. So, uh, congratulations to our whole team. Mm -hmm. Jerry, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it was a great event. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah. It was, sure. it was very nice. Very Sorry nice. that we jumped before. And then yes. Yeah. So September, just a few days left in September, it's National Food Bank Month. And I attended an event at our food bank last Thursday to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the composting program. It's a great way to combat food waste. Residents can purchase a subscription and bring a bucket of food waste to the food bank and it is turned into nutrient-rich compost. And it was great to see so many people from the sustainability community there. Some people don't realize that the food bank has raised, four, has raised 40, gar 40 gardens there to help feed our community. They also offer tours of their hydroponic greenhouse, which produces 1,200 heads of lettuce per week for food insecure families. So it's a pleasure to be there to see that uh, Thursday. And Thank heavens for the food bank under the leadership of Michelle Riley and her great team. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to wrap it all up, uh, we don't have a dog here today, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about the Animal Resource Center. Um, I think Steve mentioned it last week that they are going to uh, continue to offer the $10 Chip. microchip offer. And mm -hmm. it's actually going to be through the whole licensing season. So I think he said like a month but it's actually gonna be through January mm -hmm. 31st. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally uh, the ARC charges $25 uh, for a microchip, but even at $25, I guess, compared to going to a mm -hmm. vet's office or another place, it's usually $50. So $10 is quite the deal. Um, so if anyone is interested in taking advantage of the offer, they should just stop by um, the uh, Animal Resource Center, Monday through Friday, 10 to 6, or on Saturday, 10 to 4, and they'll take care of everything. Uh, you don't need an appointment, just come when it's convenient. Um, and they will also, which you might not get normally, is they'll um, take care of registering the microchip for you. Um, I guess it can be sometimes a confusing yeah. process for people, yeah. and if you got your um, animal chipped but you have wrong information mm -hmm. it's not going to work mm -hmm. and it's also available for cats so if you're um, a cat person you and you want your cat mm -hmm. chipped mm -hmm. uh, you can take advantage of that as well so dogs and cats uh, through mm -hmm. January through 1st can get $10 microchips so you never That's lose great. them you know and you brought up a good point you hear story after story about well they were chipped but we don't know where the people are, and that it's important to keep up with that. I know my my kid up in Alaska. I said, "You make sure that they know exactly where you are with your dog and your cat." So. Uh, <laughs> and doing cares that commissioners, you all gave readers to the jurisdictions. We did. Which I know. Is great. Mm -hmm. So we hopefully did. they never make it to the ark. Yes. Mm -hmm. They make it home. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and on top of that, we have to thank our um, our different foster groups that are out there. Yeah. And the foster parents, again, every week we're going to call you out. <laughs> uh, but we need more foster parents. For, we need more foster parents in a, for children, but we also need them for dogs. So, um, 
Well, thanks everybody. Um, it was an interesting one. And um, I'll move to adjourn. Yeah, we'll be here next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, October 3rd. What the heck? I second it. All right, I'll third it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a fantastic week. She did. <laughs>